So good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn to Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. I had the chance to get together with a, 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 a handful of you last night, and I was able to share at that time uh, a little bit about my story, a little bit about our history and why Ethiopia. Um, and, and we have been out there now for uh, just shy of two years with my wife and our three kids. My wife is Ethiopian as well. I married into the culture, and that means I married the culture. So I've got nowhere to go. Uh, I'm in a minute. So uh, anyways, living there the last two years, there's a couple things that I've missed. And one of the things that I really missed was cheese. And so when I got back here, I went to Trader Joe's. Is there a Trader Joe's here in Round Rock? And I went to that cheese section, and uh, I bought a lot of European cheeses. <laughs> and I sat down with my mom uh, at her house, and she began to talk about what is in Ethiopia and what is not in Ethiopia. And she mentioned nice things like olive oils and fancy wines and cheeses. And I have to tell you, when I come to a place like this, uh, I remember my mom's words in which she said, those things are luxuries. And I feel like when I am with you, it's a luxury uh, to have the pastors that you have John and Aaron and Bart watching over your souls, cognizant that one day they will give an account for your souls. To sit under that is a luxury. So if you're young and you're growing up under that, it's a luxury. You're receiving something wonderful, and it's such a privilege for me, and it's an honor for me to come and be a part of this. All that we want to do in Ethiopia is export the luxuries that you know. We want to export sovereign grace. We want to take the seed. How many coffee drinkers do we have? Coffee lovers. In Louisville, it's an addiction. We want to take that seed, the sovereign grace seed, the gospel centrality seed, the bringing of all life under the gospel. We want to take that seed to a place where people don't look like you, where they don't sound like you, where they don't speak your language. But we want exactly what you have right here. So it means so much that you would pray for us. Thank you. Uh, looking now to Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 8, please read along with me, or follow along, if you will, uh, as I read this text. This is no formality. This is God speaking to us this morning. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we are your sheep. Our triune God, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you have been on mission since you created this world to bring glory to yourself from every tribe, from every nation, from every people group, from every tongue. 
And you have invited us into your mission. This morning, Lord, we come reading your word. I come endeavoring to proclaim your word. But we all come to you in great need for you to make this word a reality into our lives, to affect it upon our hearts, to make it and push it into us and implant it in us so that it produces something in us, so that it produces a fruit. God, we want to see the way you see. We want to feel the way you feel. And we want to obey what you have commanded us to do. And so, Holy Spirit, would you draw attention to Christ today? Would you convict where conviction needs to take place? And would you cause running and gazing to and upon Christ to take place in this church today? For your name's sake, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Ethiopia is centered in East Africa, and Somalia is right next door. It's a Muslim nation, and out in that Muslim nation, there are very, very few Christians. Well, the most populous country of Somalis outside of Somalia itself is in Ethiopia, and in the Lord's kindness, he has given me a number of friends within this community. Several months ago, I sat with Muhammad and Abshir in a coffee shop in Addis Ababa, where I live, listening to them recount their experiences. They had been disowned by their parents. One of them, when he became a Christian, he, his wife left him and took their three kids. And the other one said he cannot find a wife because there are not very many Somali women who are believers. Both of them have been beaten and imprisoned for their faith. Muhammad alone has been imprisoned 14 times for the sake of, go of the gospel. He's been beaten unconscious on multiple occasions, and he has stories, story after story, of friends who have been killed for their faith. But neither of these men were complaining about the per persecution they have undergone. Instead, somehow, they're able to laugh about it. They were grateful for all God has done for them. And what I see in them is a willingness and a desire to return to what for you and I would be hell on earth. When you ask them why, they say, because we don't want our family and our friends and our relatives to go to hell. The same people who want to kill them. When I ask them, why don't you go underground? Why don't you have an underground church? He says, we can't be an underground church. I don't believe in that. People must know that we are Christians we have to tell them what Christ has done for them. We have to tell the gospel. It's not love. This is what they said. It's not love if we stay underground. I love my people too much to not tell them about my faith. I don't want them to go to hell. These are just a few Somalis uh, who have trusted and reached the gospel. There are millions who have not. And in his autobiography, The Insanity of God, I'm not vouching for that title, I don't like it. In his autobiography, The Insanity of God, missionary to East Africa, Nick Ripken recounts his experiences working in Mogadishu, the capital of this war-torn and failed state. He recalls a scene in the early 90s when he had newly arrived and was invited to a very special event. Four local believers and two Westerners working at some NGOs gathered together there in the capital. They prayed, had a meal together, and then as Jesus followers have done for 2,000 years, they shared the Lord's Supper together. 
He writes, We ate the bread in memory of his body, broken for us. I wondered how often down through the ages, believers had broken bread together here in the capital city of this now broken country. I had no way of knowing. But I suspected that this hadn't happened there for years. And looking back, nearly two decades later, I believe that it is altogether possible that the Lord's Supper has not been observed in Mogadishu since. We drank the grape juice in remembrance of Christ's blood, just like we did this morning, shed for us. I wondered how many unnamed and unknown Somali believers had faced persecution, suffering, and death in this country for their faith. I felt honored to worship at the Lord's table with these four brothers who were willing to risk their own blood, their own bodies, and their very lives to follow Jesus among an unbelieving people group in this unbelieving country. Unfortunately, that meaningful Lord's Supper experience took on even greater emotional poignancy for me not long after that on a horrible August morning. From here, Nick Ripkin articulates sitting in a, few, in a meeting just a few months later when a colleague busts in only to inform the team that all four of these believers had been assassinated within moments of one another in a planned effort to destroy the Christians of Mogadishu. And from here, Nick Ripkin articulates sitting. From, from here, he recalls how they were told they must leave the country or they would kill all the Somalis working with them. In the West, four Christians might go missing without the world taking much notice. But in Somalia, and in Ethiopia, in Somalia itself, a country of over 11 million, with less than 0.01% of them believing in Jesus, four believers dying in it one day leaves virtually nobody left to proclaim the good news that Jesus saves sinners. That, that crowd of 11 million is a large crowd. And my friends, Muhammad and Abshir, they cannot stop thinking of that crowd. This morning, we are going to see that because the Lord is so compassionate towards the crowds, we are to be so stirred that we pray impassioned prayers on their behalf. Our text today is going to teach us to see the lost like Jesus sees them. It's going to show us how Jesus feels and bid us to feel the same way. And finally, it's going to call us to our knees in prayer and petition on their behalf. We are being invited this morning into Christ's mission. And because the Lord is so full of compassion towards the lost, we are to be so stirred to urgent prayer on their behalf. And so, with our Bibles opened to the book of Matthew, let us begin. A brief overview of this book would show that Matthew is distinctly, has a distinctly Jewish touch to it. From the outset, Jesus is recognized as the son of David, tracing him back to that king, to the king line. And then he's also traced back as the son of Abraham, thus fulfilling Old Testament prophecy. He is also seen as putting forward the application of Old Testament law and confronting the legalism and tradition of the Jewish Pharisees. And in Matthew 9, 35 through 38, our text for this morning, he is seen going throughout all the Jewish cities and villages of Israel, specifically to those of his same ethnicity and religious background. But then, in the beginning of the next chapter, he will send out his 12 disciples. He will enlist them and send them out on a short-term missionary trip specifically and only to the house of Israel. And so what we are about to see this morning is Israel through the eyes of Jesus. But we must remember as we do this, to see Israel from 
our perspective, from our side of the cross, from this side of the cross. Israel is meant to be something of a specimen of the whole world. What is in the hearts of Israel is in the hearts of the whole world. Their greatest needs are your greatest needs and my greatest needs. Their greatest needs are the greatest needs of the entire world right now as we are in church. If you are taking notes this morning, our outline will consist of three points. We're going to take one pass through verses 35 and 36 and make an observation, and then we're going to go back through it again. We're going to take another pass through 35 and 36, and then we'll look in verses 37 and 38. And so if you're taking notes this morning, our first point is to see what Jesus sees. Under this first point, I want to draw our attention to the two observations of Christ. He is going from city to city, from village to village, and the accent in verses 35 and 36 is on what Jesus is seeing as he does ministry. In verse 35, there are those who need to hear the gospel, those who are diseased, and those who are afflicted. And then in verse 36, the state of the people is articulated in even more severe language. They are harassed and helpless. Or, as the King James Version would put it, they are weary and scattered. Or as one other translation would put it, they were torn and thrown down. What is more, they are like sheep without a shepherd. They are people open and exposed to the enemy with nobody and nothing to protect them. There is no creature more vulnerable to attack. We don't have sheep crossing the streets in America, but in Ethiopia you see them everywhere. And a sheep without a shepherd does not last Long. There's no creature more vulnerable to attack, no creature more vulnerable to getting themselves in trouble than a sheep without a shepherd. The first thing we have to see, if we're to see what Jesus sees, then we are to see the utter lostness of the house of Israel. Sheep without a shepherd. That was a phrase in the Old Testament which typically referred to to a lack of political leadership. But here in the context of Matthew chapter 9, this term denotes spiritual lostness. We're talking about more of the way we Christians talk when we talk about somebody being lost. They don't have guidance. They don't have care. Sheep wander into danger when there is no shepherd. And these lost sheep of Israel had exchanged the truth of God were a lie. These were a people coming before God on the basis of their own righteousness. These were a people pursuing food and sex and drink and entertainment. And all the while, they were thinking that these would be the things that would satisfy them. Many New Testament accounts of Jesus are meant to show us his humanity or his humanness or the ways in which he was just like us. He was fully man, and the Bible again and again draws attention to this fact. But here in this text, our attention is to be drawn to the fact that with regards to the lostness of man, Jesus was nothing like us. Here in verses 35 and 36, Jesus is clearly not being portrayed as just another sheep amongst so many other sheep without a shepherd. Instead, Christ is being seen as the remedy to their lack of direction. He is the right direction. He is the shepherd. He is the great condescender. And Christ, as the good shepherd, sees their, shepherd, lost, their shepherdless, lost state. He sees it. It's not lost on him. The second thing that Jesus sees is their vastness. He doesn't simply see their lostness, but in verse 36, he sees crowds, lost people. He saw the numbers. 
He saw the numbers, and it affected him. Some estimates put the population of Galilee at around 3 million during this time, with potentially around 200 villages and cities. And as Jesus went from city to city, he saw crowds of sheep without a shepherd. This is interesting to note because we are given so many stories of the individuals throughout the Gospels which make up these crowds. We are told of this specific account of the man being let down through the roof by his friends, right? Or the woman with the flow who touched Jesus' garment. But these specific accounts are only meant to put names and faces to the vastness of the crowds. These specific accounts are to serve as specimens, if you will, of the crowds as a whole. And brothers and sisters, we may be in Israel within the context of our scripture this morning. And we may be specifically talking about the, G the Jewish people in Jesus' day. But as I mentioned just a bit ago, they're here to serve as specimens for the crowds that are in the world in our day. They have not changed. The population of the world this morning stands at around 7.7 .7 billion. Out of those nearly 8 billion people, the, the, the most liberal estimations guess the world population to consist of 2.5 billion Christians. That number, 2.5 billion, that includes every type of denomination. It includes cults. It includes Roman Catholics. But I believe that number to be way lower than 2.5 billion, and I would imagine you do too. But let's just pause for the sake of clarity, for the sake of conversation, and let's say, let's pretend that those 2.5 billion are genuinely converted. That still leaves 5.2 billion individuals who are harassed and helpless, 5.2 billion souls headed to a Christless eternity. That is a crowd. We have to see that crowd. That crowd is harassed, and that crowd is helpless. And that crowd does not have a shepherd. They are sheep without a shepherd. What a luxury it is to come into this church today and to sing songs of Jesus and to be led by men who are gifts from that God. Shepherds. They are sheep without shepherds. The crowd is on its way to a place that I think we don't like to talk about. We sang about it briefly this morning. A hell, a real hell, that lasts forever and ever 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 and ever. It never ends. We have to see what Jesus saw. And we don't have to look far, do we, to find specimens of this crowd of 5.2 billion, do we? There are entire nations in this crowd. There are entire people groups in this crowd. A few years ago, I was so gripped by the lostness of the nation where I live, Ethiopia. I was trekking eastward from Harar, towards Addis Ababa with my brother-in-law and another missionary along a ridge of mountains. I, I shared this story last night. And as I looked out to the north, as far as I could see, there was vi villages, 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 lots of villages. We're on the top of the mountains traveling. Then I looked to the south. Villages, villages, villages. And then we keep driving, and on the left-hand side of the road, I see this progression of people wearing black robes. And as we pass them in the car, we come to the front, and there's four people holding a 
casket. Carrying a dead man. Statistically speaking, there's not a single Christian within miles and miles, hundreds of miles of this place. And I was gripped. The picture was staggering. That whole village is following this dead man. That whole village was following him to a Christless eternity. The crowds all across this globe, including here and Round Rock and in Austin, are so vast. Christ saw that they were lost, and he saw that they were large. And I think that this text is bidding us this morning to see that as well. Point number two. Feel what Jesus feels. The knowledge and the awareness of these large crowds of lostness. This knowledge traveled from Christ's head down to his heart. And it elicited an emotional response from within his being. Jesus didn't simply make an observation that the crowds were large. He didn't simply see that they were lost. He was affected. And may I point out once again, that this also is a characteristic of Christ that distinguishes him from ourselves. Though Jesus is at this point in his early 30s, having lived plenty of life, he has not become hardened. He has not become callous to the helpless condition of man in his fallen state. And though he is the incarnate sovereign God of all the world, and nothing can happen apart from his will. Here, under point number two, we're going to see that the God-man is so moved emotionally that he is affected physically. But before we get into that, let's stick with the rhythm of the text. Before we consider what Jesus is feeling, let's consider what those feelings had been driving him to do. In verse 35, the emphasis is on the all and the every. Jesus went throughout all the cities and he was healing every disease and every affliction. It is obvious that there were points in Christ's ministry in which he would have to draw away from the crowds and go rest or go pray because of his exhaustion. It's not difficult to imagine the masses pressing in around him, wanting to hear from him and wanting to be healed. But then at some point, he has to turn and he has to exit the crowd and go and rest. Right? He's a man. We can be sure that the man, Christ Jesus, did at some point have to say, I can't. He had to refuse healing and ministry at some point. We see him going and resting. However, there is no documented account in all of the New Testament where we see Christ refusing to heal an individual. We have, given, we have been given zero accounts, zero stories of Jesus saying, no, no. There's not one. Instead, the emphasis in these accounts may easily be summarized by the 35th verse, which we're in right now of Matthew chapter 9. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. So that is what he was doing. What were the feelings he was experiencing? Look with me at verse 36. When he saw the large crowds of lost sheep, he felt compassion. Is that not one of the most wonderful words? that your, li- your eyes could possibly land upon this morning? Is that not one of the most wonderful words that your eyes could land upon in all of the Bible? The God of all the world has left heaven 
And the worship of angels day after day, night after night, proclaiming His holiness. And He has come down to these rebels. But He has not come with a vendetta. He hasn't come scheming revenge, which He deserves. He's come with compassion. In America, we like to say uh, to people that we love, we say, I love you with all my heart. I, I tell my kids this every night. I love you with all my heart. But in other parts of the world, that's not the way they communicate. The place of emotion is centered in the stomach. For instance, when I was dating my wife, who is Ethiopian, her name is Kena'an, when I was dating my wife, we had a long-distance relationship in which we wouldn't see each other sometimes for a few months. And when we would talk on, on Skype or on Facebook, she would refer to me as Yene Hod. That means my stomach. That sounds a bit weird to us in the States. Uh, if we're talking about our stomach, we are hoping something like Ruth's Chris is stirring our affections. That wasn't the case with my wife. That was a term of endearment. Her articulation of what was taking place emotionally and with her affections was centralized in her stomach. That is what is going on here when we read the English translation, compassion. Jesus, I mean, this is, this is packed language, you guys. Jesus is feeling, or y'all, sorry. Jesus is feeling a deep-seated yearning from his bowels, the central place of feeling. And because of it, he is going to the all. He's going to the every within Israel. And this, this is what lies behind the cross compassion. It was birthed in the heart of God the Father. Compassion. It is what drove the Father to give His only begotten Son. Compassion. It was in the heart of the Son and it is what drove Him from heaven to be amongst a lost people. Compassion is what caused Him to give up all of His rights. Compassion drove Jesus to the cross. Compassion is what caused Jesus to take our place and to die as a substitute for our sins. Compassion is what drove him to give us his righteousness while taking our sins. Compassion is what made him swallow that cup of God's righteousness, God's wrath, his righteous wrath which was due to you and to me. Compassion is what made Jesus become just as sinful as you and I. Only it wasn't his sin, it was ours. Compassion. Compassion is why Christ is dead for sinners like you and I this morning. It is what drove him to the alls and to the everys, as found in verse 35. He is dead for every kind of sin. He is dead for every kind of man, for every kind of woman, for every kind of child. For those who love their sin, because Christ is compassionate, He is dead for you. For those who are racists, He is dead for you. For those who are addicted to pornography, and statistically speaking, you're in this room. Christ is dead for you. For drug abusers, if you're an alcoholic this morning, Christ is dead for you. God forgetters, which is you and me, He's dead for us this morning. For self-righteous people who think that they have God's favor based upon their own merits, Christ is dead for you this morning. Every one of you, all of you, 
Christ is dead for the crowds that are outside of this building, Round Rock, right now. For the crowds from here to Austin. Christ is dead for them because of his compassion. He is dead for them. What sin is there that troubles your conscience this morning? Is there a sin that troubles your conscience? What have you done in the past that you cannot let know, let go? You cannot stop thinking about it. You cannot forget it. What troubles you as you fall asleep? Is there a sin that won't let you go that you wonder, has God forgiven this? Will God forgive this? Is there a sin that you spend hours turning over in your head day after day after day and you just knead it and you rub it thinking someday it's going to turn into a pearl? But it won't because it's sin. Christ is dead for it. Christ is dead for that sin too. If you are here today and you have never trusted in the person of Jesus Christ, for salvation from your sin. Would you see his compassion for you this morning? Would you trust him now? Come to him now and know his compassion. Don't wait till the end of this sermon. Don't wait until you're better. He invites you now. There is nothing to do. He's already done it for you. There's nothing to pay. He's already paid it for you. Simply trust him. He is full of compassion for you, just as he was compassionate towards all the cities and villages of Israel. And for those of us who are believers who have trusted in Christ, look in the text and tell me, can you see yourself? Can you spot yourself? In verse 37, while feeling compassion for the lost, He turns, so to speak. And then he says to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now he is asking or commanding his disciples to essentially partner with him in a specific manner. He's giving them an invitation. But in order for them to do what he is commanding them to do, there is something of a prerequisite. We're not talking about salvation. We're talking about ministry. There's a prerequisite. They must first feel what he feels. He wants them to pray earnestly. And that requires a sort of emotional obedience because it is impossible to do anything in earnest when you do not feel earnestly about the matter. To pray earnestly connotes begging or imploring or urgently asking for something with severe and intense conviction. And the word picture that Jesus gives us is supposed to help us to understand why we're to feel this sense of urgency and conviction and compassion. There's no need for an illustration at this point because the illustration's right here in the text. Typically in the Old Testament, this term harvest, it had with it, it carried with it the concept of final judgment. And at various points in the New Testament, Jesus And John the Baptist both use it that way. But scholar R.T. France, in his commentary on Matthew, notes with regards to this text, here, however, his thought is rather on men's readiness now to respond to the gospel by fleeing from wrath to come. The context shows that the laborers here are not angels sent out to execute final judgment on the nations, as his Jewish hearers would expect, but men sent out to rescue others from judgment and beginning within Israel itself. End quote. No, sorry. For this, the task of disciples were and always has been too few. End quote. And so the amount of work to be done, it vastly outnumbers the workers. For us to get this in 2019, in Austin, Texas, I think that we have to leave our suburban context and we have to enter into an agrarian, agricultural setting. 
in which Christ was living and ministering. So we're going to get into our time machines. We're going to put that back to Matthew chapter 9. We're going to put on our field boots. Some of you have cowboy boots on. That will not do. And we're going to push that button and we're going to go back in time. And the time machine opens and we step out and we are in Israel. And there's a vast field of ripe fruit. But you're not just a visitor. You're the farmer. That is your field. And it is ready for the picking. But there are not many workers, and that which is not harvested will go to waste. The field represents a number of things to you, this field of yours. It is your livelihood in just about every way. You will eat of its fruit. You will sell its product to buy supplies and other food items. And then we will take some of it and we will tithe it to the Lord. And we will pay our taxes to Caesar from this reaping. And so the fact that there are not enough workers to harvest this field, it presents more than simply a dilemma. It is a crisis. Do you see your corn? Do you see your beans falling to the ground? Do you see the worms crawling through your fruit and destroying it? Do you see the locusts stealing away your fruit? It is a crisis. Do you feel the sense of panic that the farmer feels? You are the farmer. As you try to go about and figure out what is the best expenditure of your time to start picking or to go into the town, to go into Austin, or to go into the, the city place and ask the townsmen for help. There's no John Deere harvesting tractors available, and no matter how much you plead with your friends and family and neighbors, there are simply not enough hands to get all the work done. And so this sense of panic comes in, this sense of urgency, this sense of earnest, it is all right here lodged in your chest, and you can't get away from it. And all this urgency, it's supposed to be taken before the one who is the Lord of the harvest. And when we call him Lord, when we say Lord of the harvest, we mean that everything that happens on that field happens according to his will. He's the Lord of that field and he is the Lord of all that is harvested on that field. He's the Lord of the harvest. All of the sudden, I am experiencing these feelings that are in tension because I am believing truths that are in tension. I am believing on the one hand that there are many people who are on their way to a Christless eternity. And I'm supposed to feel compassion. The compassion of Christ himself. I'm supposed to feel a burdened sense of urgency. But then I'm also believing on the other end. That there, are, that there is a God who is sovereign. And that nothing happens apart from his will. Down to the most minute detail. Down to the hairs that fall out of my head. A lot of them have. In 1787, before the modern missionary movement as we know it had been birthed, a young, freshly ordained William Carey, who's the, one of the first mission, the very first missionary sent out, he sat at a minister's fraternal in the Northampton Association in England. What we should know is that in that day, Christians did not carry this missional burden that many of our churches today have. In fact, a prevalent view at this time was that if God wanted to reach those far-off heathens, he would go and he would do it himself. He didn't need assistance from man. Well, this young William Carey, he sat in this meeting, remaining quiet and shy as the older men talked and discussed and shared their pastors. That is, until he was called upon to speak 
the famous preacher, Reverend Ryland Sr., thought it would be best to give the younger generation a voice at this meeting and asked William Carey to speak on a new topic. And upon asking Carey what he would be speaking about, about, Carey responded, I would like to discuss the idea that when Jesus Christ gave the command to his disciples to preach the gospel to the ends of the earth, he meant it to include not just his disciples who were alive at that time, but all who would follow him from then on. And Reverend Ryland Sr. looked at young Carrie with that kind of look that an old man sometimes throws at young men that says, man, you are out of line. You are out of line. And he lifts up his finger and he points at him. And this is what he said. Here we have an example of a young man who knows nothing about the plan of God. The Almighty does not need a man to speak for him. He will enlighten the heathen in his own way when he sees fit. It is not our place to interfere with the process. And glaring at Carrie with his finger still pointed, he said, Young man, you are a miserable enthusiast for suggesting otherwise. Yes, God is sovereign and his will will most surely come to pass. It will be accomplished. But he has also sovereignly ordained means as the way of executing that will. And prayer is the means he has ordained to carry out his will. This morning, I don't think that we here at Redemption Hill, I don't think that we as Sovereign Grace Churches, I don't think that you are in danger of coming under old Reverend Ryland Sr.'s train of thinking. I don't think you're there. What I want to get at is our feelings, our emotions. I said earlier, I think this is asking for emotional obedience. We must never make the mistake that old Reverend Ryland Sr. made. We must not let our hearts slip into a place which says, if God wants to save those people, he doesn't need our help. He doesn't need our help. I want you to hear me say that this morning. But that is a false dichotomy. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of Christ. And the norm in God's economy is not to send angels nor dreams, but rather to send messengers. And sometimes he sends the kinds of messengers we wouldn't think he would. I left Ethiopia on a Wednesday about three and a half weeks ago. And the Saturday before I left, I was called upon by some Somalis some Somali believers, to come and give training on evangelism. Well, I was getting ready to travel for three months, and I, this is my only Saturday before, and I'm thinking, I need to spend my day packing and preparing. I really did not want to go. But out of a sense of duty and a remembrance that I'm going to stand before God, and this is an unreached people group, I went and I trained these Somalis. And as I was training them, the Bibles were passed around and I asked them to read some verses, on, some evangelistic verses. But what I learned were that half of them were illiterate. And at the end of the, the, the time, we got down on our knees and prayed and one guy said, can I take a photo? And I thought, oh, there's nothing worth taking a photo of here. This, this is not, nothing's going to happen with this. This is a waste of my time. But to say I did it to God on the last day, Not out of a sense of you're going to send me to hell, but just to be responsible with what he's given me, I went. I got an email four days ago from my Somali partner. And this is what it said. Michael, you should know that those youth that we trained to evangelize just a couple weeks ago, they have led 27 Muslims to faith. He sends messengers. He didn't need those young people. They don't bring much to the table. But the Lord used them. But this morning, I am not talking about evangelism. And I am not here to tell you to go. That's not the text that I'm preaching from. I'm not preaching on the Great Commission. That's many chapters later. Before Jesus ever told his disciples to go, 
He told them to pray. The duty that Jesus set before us is one to be done passionately on our knees. And this brings me to our final point this evening or this morning. Our first point was to see what Jesus sees. The second point is to feel what Jesus feels. And the third point is to do what Jesus commands. We have seen that Jesus saw the lostness of the crowds. And if you are a Christian, I imagine you have felt Christ's compassion towards you. And hopefully you're feeling something of the same compassion that Christ felt towards those crowds. And now we're being called to action. Earlier I asked if you see yourself in the text, and now I'm going to tell you point blank that you and I are the disciples that Jesus is turning to and telling to pray. Does this lay an inordinate amount of pressure upon you? Is this too much being given to us? We are to feel some sense of urgency towards the lost and to be prayerful on their behalf. But we have to notice who we are. We are the disciples. We are no longer in that crowd. You have been saved from your sins. Christ has washed you. Christ has cleansed you. You have been justified and heaven is waiting for you. But until then, until that day, Christ is welcoming us, you and I, into his mission. And Christ is sharing with us his burden for the lost. You cannot save them. I cannot save them. Only he can save them. But we are far from useless. We can pray for them. We are commanded to earnestly pray for them. That gospel messengers would be sent to them. And my friends, when we begin to pray verbatim what Jesus told us to pray, quoting him, we can be quite confident that we are praying the will of God. Amen? So what are we supposed to pray for? What do we pray? We pray for God to raise up and to send out more gospel workers, more gospel messengers. Our first response is not a need to go. It's not to say, send me, I will go. Because not all are equipped, not all are gifted. This is not a call for the unskilled and the ill-equipped to relocate to the ends of the earth. Our first response is not to go, but to pray. Our first response to the transgender barista that you work with or that you order coffee from first thing in the morning is broken hearted compassionate prayer when we go home for thanksgiving and we're surrounded by our unbelieving relatives our first response to them in their hostile thinking towards us as followers of Jesus is prayer broken hearted prayer when I tell you that there are entire villages in Ethiopia that know nothing of Christ, oh God, the first response is not, send me, I'll go. It's, oh God, would you save? Oh God, would you send out messengers of the gospel? It is a passionate, compassionate, urgent prayer to God to raise up preachers of the gospel. Is your heart there this morning? Are you up to the task? I will be honest, and I think I just shared with you a minute ago with that story, that my heart is not always there. So if your heart is not in a place of brokenness for the lost, does that mean that we're exempt from this command, or does that mean we get to just walk away? No, if our heart is apathetic, we should confess it before the Lord and we should remember what he declares over us, that we are saved by free grace. We were in the crowd. And just being practical, can I recommend that you commit to praying for the lost every day for the next 40 days? There's nothing magical about that number, but there is habit-forming power and repetition. Imagine what the Lord might do in 40 days from now if we are sick to our stomachs like Jesus with compassion for the lost and we're praying for God to raise up more John Paynes, more C.J. Mahaney's, more Martin Luther's, more Jeff Perswell's, more Jim Carrey's, more Jim Elliott's, more John Piper's, more David Platt's. What if we prayed for God to send these people? 
What a work. What a work he will have done in our hearts. Don't you see? Can you see what's built into that prayer when we start praying that way? What's built into that prayer is glory for another outside ourselves. You are not the superstar. I'm not the superstar. You are not in the prayer. I'm not in the prayer. The prayer is not about us. It's not for us. It's not to us to be really able to pray this prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Some serious soul surgery will have taken place in our hearts. We have to be broken hearted. For the lost, but we also have to be sold out to the glory of the Lord of the harvest. This is a sweet place to be in, brothers and sisters, to be broken hearted for the lost, to be on mission with Christ, to know that God is sovereign, to know that his plan is so massive. And he's so powerful that he gets things done through the tearful prayers of his saints and all for his glory. And guess what will happen if we see what Jesus sees and feel what Jesus feels and pray as Jesus commanded us to pray. He'll raise up more workers, more clear gospel proclaimers, and more missionaries until send them out into the harvest and the people will believe in Jesus and he will answer our prayers and he might even send you let's pray our good God in heaven we pray that you would take these weak efforts of mine and that you would Take everything that was distracting about this morning from me, from my personality, from my way of deliverance, and that you would just throw it to the wind. And everything that's from you would be remaining in our hearts. And that Satan would not come and steal it. Pray that the lasting impression, the lasting savor in my brothers' and sisters' hearts would be what a sweet savior. I was in that crowd and you had mercy on me. Oh God, would you send somebody like you sent somebody to me? In Jesus' name.